Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, hello. 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 <laughs> um, um, you know, it, it is so hard to find anything to say after a week of seeing our country nearly yeah. burn to the ground. Mm. Um, but I, I, I think it just, um, I mean, for me, it reawakens um, what I think is the value of this club. And that is that it gives space and encouragement for people to contemplate and to become whole. And it's really going to take whole people to fix this broken world. Um, and I don't have anything more to say about current events. And um, but I, I I think this is necessary and not a distraction from from what's been going on. Um, so this is what we're going to do today. Um, um, we're going to hear a wonderful talk by Frances McCormick. Uh, and then we're going to have some discussion about her talk, question and answer, and some open discussion. People can share whatever they're thinking and feeling. So I'm going to introduce our very own Frances McCormick. Um, and the, the Practically the last thing I did in 2020 was to attend an April exhibition of Francis McCormick's paintings mm. called Rooted in Wonder um, out in um, Marin. And it seems like after that, I went home and locked myself inside and it's been bad news ever since. <laughs> um, and her paintings were the kind of paintings that remind me why it's important to actually see the original artwork and not simply see images. Um, they were big, visceral paintings. Um, the paint had been applied in a number of different expert techniques. Um, and the images were, for me, a step into a world of the psyche. So I'm really delighted that Francis has agreed to speak to us uh, today about her work. Um, briefly, Frances has been a member of the APC since December 20th of 2014. She was born in Boston, received her MSA, MFA from the University of California, Berkeley. She's a professor emerita at the San Francisco Art Institute. And if you don't know anything about the San Francisco Art Institute, it is a powerhouse of Western West Coast art movements. Um, so she's basically in the same league of some other distinguished artists who have taught at the Institute, including painters like Clifford Still, Mark Rothko, Richard Diebenkorn, Jay DeFeo, Elmer Bischoff, David Park, Roy DeForest, and Joan Brown. And photographers like Ansel Adams, Dorothea Lang, Inna Jean Cunningham, and Minor White, to name but a few. So this, um, so we get to hang out with her on a first name basis. Um, so please give a warm welcome to Francis McCormick. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Um, and now I think I need to share my screen. You do. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, Stephen. Um, that kind of uh, is, uh, anyway, <laughs> it was a very nice introduction. And thank you all for, for having me. Um, I want to give you a bit of an overview of what we'll do. Uh, I'll just talk about what's, uh, how I'm going to present this. Um, the talk will be about 45 minutes, more or less. Uh, and it's fine to ask questions. Uh, you can ask questions during the talk or uh, after, the, after the talk. Um, th so the program is, I'll begin by making a few observations about painting in general, and then briefly define what I mean by both wonder and limitation. Uh, it's a kind of, it, it's 
believe it or not, I when I thought of this title, I didn't, I wasn't even thinking about our incredible limitation that we're all experiencing right now. Um, and I hope that the relationship that I see between them is not too idiosyncratic. I'm not a scholar. So this is an imaginative connection and I'm not trying to arrive at, at anything definitive. Uh, I hope that the relationship that I see between wonder and limitation grows clearer over the time of the talk. But uh, ideally, I'd really love the talk to function as a prompt for you uh, to, to make your own associations uh, between these two states. Um, then I'll show my paintings uh, introduced by a diagram of the four main forms that uh, I have evolved over time. Some forms are simple and obvious and others are a bit more complex and hidden. That's why I made this little diagram. Um, after the paintings, after I show you the paintings, uh, I'm gonna show just a minute or two of a video from a collaboration that I did with the San Francisco composer, Kurt Rohde, and the writer and Buddhist teacher, Su Moon, uh, titled Artifacts, uh, that was first performed at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music in 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be more sort of talk at the beginning of this talk and uh, more images in the second part. So just in case you're wondering where are the paintings. Um, anyway, so talking about paintings, uh, especially abstract or semi-abstract paintings is pretty tricky. Um, representative paintings, uh, narrative paintings, I think are easier to discuss. So I want to share a couple of reservations. Um, one of them, Stephen, I think already brought up, but uh, the first has to do with reproduction. A painting is made up of colored dirt smeared on a flat surface. The brush strokes reveal the weight, the speed, the pressure, the carefulness or carelessness of the painter. When the image is projected onto a screen into a dark room or reduced uh, onto a computer screen, so much of what makes up a painting uh, isn't available to us. Of course, I know you all know this, but I just feel like it's important to point it out and now we're pointing it out for the second time. Um, so this first image is by the artist Robert Irwin. Uh, there's a similar piece to this in the Anderson collection uh, at Stanford, if any of you visit that collection. Um, after Irwin finished his graduate studies, he went to Europe to see the paintings that he had previously seen only as slide projections in art history classes. You know, most, most painters, most people are thrilled to see the action, to get a chance to see the actual paintings in the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, but Erwin found out, or he, he discovered that he, when he saw the paintings, he was disappointed. And he understood that what held his interest was the transparency and the light of the slide projections. That was what was beautiful to him. Um, he went on, uh, Irwin went on to be one of the founders of the uh, light and space movement in Southern California. And I bring this up for a couple of reasons. One, because I regret that you can't, you, you know, I value uh, not the light and transparency of this projected image, but the actual, uh, the material and the scale and the weight what, what Stephen described uh, is, is what is interesting to me about paintings. Um, so that's one reason I bring this up. But two, the other reason I bring this up is that I think Irwin, in his inability to see through what, what the expected sort of conventional response was supposed to be 
to seeing actual paintings, to actually having the ability to notice and locate where the sense of wonder was for him in the light, in the translucency. Um, it, that ability to locate wonder was so crucial to all his later work. It created his later work. So there, there is um, a really wonderful account of uh, early, the early work of Robert Irwin by the uh, uh, writer Lawrence Weschler uh, that's, that's titled, um, Seeing is Forgetting the Name of the Thing One Sees. So um, anyway, uh, the other reservation I have uh, is talking about ideas that are connected to my images. The painter Philip Guston used to quote the French poet Paul Valéry, who said, a poem should not disappear into meaning. And I feel like a painting should not disappear into meaning as well. Mm -hmm. so, so my hope is that, that this talk and these ideas, you will think of them as structures of the imagination rather than the meanings of my paintings. That's, that's not what I'm trying to explain. Ideally, you would see the actual paintings in quiet or in silence, and then we might have a conversation, but uh, these are definitely not ideal times. So hopefully this is a look into how my paintings develop, the back and forth between idea and action. In abstract work, uh, that process is often more difficult to describe, and in some ways more of an ordeal, I think, than uh, in representational painting. So here, uh, so now why wonder and limitation? By wonder, uh, I mean what I think most of us mean, a sense of surprise, awe, and delight. As an aesthetic experience, wonder contains an element of pleasure, more than say the experience of the sublime, which has, has an element of awe, but it also has an undercurrent of terror. Um, Philip Fisher in his book, Wonder, the Rainbow, and the Aesthetics of Rare Experiences, it's quite a title, uh, calls wonder the most neglected of primary aesthetic experiences within modernity, involving delight or the pleasure principle rather than the death principle. Wonder could also be described as the marvelous. Rasa is a concept in Indian aesthetic theory. Uh, it, rasa translates to something like essence or flavor. Um, and some of the essences in that, in that aesthetic theory are uh, something like, they are like the erotic, the comic, the heroic, the odious, um, and one of them is the marvelous. So over time, I realized that my orientation to the world, as well as to artwork, was through the lens of the marvelous. Or to put it another way, the experience of wonder uh, was essential to any real creative endeavor. And in my case, wonder functions both as a source of the work as well as a response that I would like to create in the viewer. There are countless images that I could have shared with you about visual wonder, but I just selected a few images. Uh, these are, this is, <laughs> this is Pierre Bonnard. He's sitting in his dining room. And um, these are some paintings by, by Bonnard. Uh, this is his dining room. So I think this is a good example of a lens of the marvelous or a sense of wonder. His dining room was a perfectly uh, pedestrian, prosaic, ordinary, unremarkable place. But when you look at it through his paintings, uh, it, it's glorious. You know, some, that transformation happens in a number of ways. Uh, this is, uh, he's, Bonnard is probably most famous known as the painter who painted his wife in the bathroom uh, over and over again, this sort of celebration of domesticity. Mm. Um, 
So this is uh, the bathroom from 1932. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this is uh, the open window, simply an open window. I, Bonard's one of my favorite painters. Uh, so uh, he, I think he really gives you a sense of what the lens of the marble is. And then other, other paintings, um, this is Saceda, who's a, a Sienese painter, uh, Saint Anthony beaten by, by the devils. Um, this is Rama and Sita enthroned. Uh, the color is, is just extraordinary. Um, and this is the American painter, watercolorist, Charles Birchfield. This is called Autumn Fantasy, 1939. Um, and in Birchfield's uh, landscapes, you almost get a sense, they're almost uh, hallucinogenic. Mm. You almost have a sense of the life force pulsing through the landscape uh, when you look at his work. And this is, I think, a painter that most of us know, Richard Diebenkorn mm -hmm. from his Ocean Park series. Uh, he was painting basically Southern California light and architecture and through this lens of formality and color. Um, okay. So, um, because wonder is based in a sense of delight or surprise or pleasure, I think we have a tendency to dismiss it or not give it much importance. One very odd idiosyncratic instance of what might be called the results of the experience of wonder happened many years ago uh, during one of the first painting classes I was teaching at San Francisco State University. Um, one of the students, this very beautiful uh, young woman would come into the painting studio and she was always in these extraordinary clothes. They were, they were beautiful clothes, but they were not even expensive clothes. They, I think they were antique. They were like fan blouses and brooches and extraordinary textiles and the most inappropriate clothes for uh, you know, a painting studio. She would put on an apron and, but then she would stand as far away from the palette as possible she would mix up the paint as in the way she mixed up the paint, it was almost like she was sauteing onions. And then she would just plop the paint on the uh, surface of the canvas. And it was such a radically different approach to the material that I really didn't know how to respond or, or what to say. Uh, what, what could I tell her? Um, it was an attitude that was completely foreign to me. Shortly after this, I was in my studio. I was struggling with a painting, uh, very unhappy with what was going on, frustrated. And I just made a joke to myself. I thought, well, you know, just try paint like Mary, uh, which was the name of the student. And it was just an amusement. But she, almost immediately, I could tell uh, that what was happening in my paintings, uh, they were really suffering from an ex, a kind of excess of willfulness or a need for control that was both defeating to the material and limiting to the development of the images. Uh, you know, this is something, you know, throwing the paint around is something that so many students ask, you know, how do I go from representation to abstract work? And my, my answer is always based in form, but there are plenty of ways I could have read in books about Jackson Pollock, about Helen Frankenthaler, but I think it was being a witness to the actual uh, physicality of it that really impressed me. Um, I'm sorry I don't have any images of earlier work uh, of those rep more representational works. But after this experiment in my studio, my painting really opened up. 
The images were more satisfyingly unpredictable. The paint uh, began to breathe on the canvas. Um, that's probably, a, you know, saying that, I don't know if it means much to you, but, but there's a, a big difference to me between paint that looks dead and paint that's breathing and alive. Um, and it was kind of an epiphany by way of my response to the student, which you could possibly say was based in wonder. It was also at this time that I began to rotate my paintings so that the gravity of the paint sort of went in different directions and didn't all have the same sense of gravity, which was really beginning to bother me at that time. So this is one of those uh, results of that uh, experiment. This is the great piece of turf. Um, this is called, uh, the title is Invincible Like Water from 1989. And I should say that uh, I'm not gonna give dimensions on the paintings. All of the paintings are mostly five feet, mostly five feet, between four feet and six feet. So they're all pretty large paintings. And when I, when I show you a smaller painting, I'll say, you know, I'll, I'll identify it, but they're, but they're mostly, you know, five feet uh, or so. Uh, this is the knot, this is called Knot in the Water. And it was the first appearance, you can see this almost ghost-like garden hose. I was struggling at the time with how do you make an, a more abstract painting. And I was, I simply used the garden hose as a compositional device to break up the rectangle. Um, but this form becomes more and more impor important in the paintings as they go on. Uh, this is called Garden Gate, uh, 1989. And I always think of this as my deliverance from too much deliberateness. Uh, the paint uh, gets the most, I think, out of control that it's ever been uh, in, my, in my practice. This is Permit Me Voyage from 1990. Okay. All right. And this is, uh, this is just a small print. So this is a small piece. Um, so my process is mostly intuitive. I don't have an image of what I want the painting to look like when I'm finished. And I don't start from a sketch. Willem de Kooning refers to uh, a slipping glimpse. And I think that's a good description of where I start from a kind of slipping glimpse. A huge part of the thrill of painting for me is when the painting takes off in an unpredictable direction and I have to try to hold on to the original glimpse. Um, I'm really more interested in creating a dynamic uh, or an image of a dynamic than than fleshing out an idea that, you know, an image that I see in my head. I, I, it's just not possible for me. So limitation, well, let's move to limitation. Um, the definition of limitation includes notions of confinement, boundary, control, restriction. Uh, quite a few years ago, uh, I was reading an essay by James Hillman titled On the Necessity of Abnormal Psychology. And in it, he referred to Aristotle, who describes necessity as that which cannot be persuaded. So limitation, necessity, constriction. But I love that term, that which cannot be persuaded. Uh, this seems not only a phrase that describes many situations in life, but also for me, a way to think about certain structural elements or repeating forms in my paintings. The immovable, the implacable, the archit more architectural forms in, co in contrast to the organic, impetuous, impulsive uh, forms represented by uh, those sort of rope-like, vine-like, root-like form. Uh, one which is on the screen now, which is almost, uh, this isn't in any chronological order, but this is one of the examples where I think the form almost exists, exists as, a, as a character in itself, uh, which isn't always the case. 
And, you know, and when I was preparing these notes uh, for this talk, I was thinking how a deadline is a limitation. And a deadline is, is a little bit like the firing squad, which, you know, brings a focus. So, um, and, and of course, the ultimate limitation is death. And uh, that's, um, we're not gonna, that's not gonna be part of the discussion, but um, that is all, I think, part of the, that archetype, uh, archetype of limitation. Uh, the evolution of my notion of limitation or as a form or a form representing limitation in my images happened in fits and starts over time. And it really never appeared as any kind of conceptual package all at once. Uh, it was really back and forth, thinking, painting, thinking, painting. Um, so the, for the sake of brevity and clarity, I'm giving you a bird's eye view of the images over time, not a chronological report. So here's the diagram. Uh, this is my best attempt at separating out the basic forms in the paintings that you'll see. And they're, uh, as I talk, they're the ways in which they stand in for me in so, as, as a kind of limitation. There's the bar, just a very simple bar. Um, the corset vase shape, uh, which I think is much more revealing about limitation, a very fundamental tree shape. And then finally, the last few paintings uh, where it, there's the, uh, the sense of paradise as a walled garden. Uh, so this, uh, painting is called Pilar's Prediction. And as with a number of paintings, the image revolved around an action that I made out of frustration. I was unhappy with the painting. Actually, you know, I'm, when, as a painter, or in my experience of painting, you're unhappy with the painting 90% of the time. I, I always tell students, if you, if you want to be an artist, you need to cultivate the capacity for sustained frustration. That's what painting feels like uh, to me. Um, anyway, I was unhappy with the painting and I decided to wipe it out. So I took a roller and was rolling across the painting. And when I stepped back, I saw this bar, uh, this stark white line bisecting the painting. And I saw that it was both a separate space and an architectural element in many images. It's, it's, a, it's been in many images over the years, but it was a happy accident. It was really just came out of frustration. Um, the mostly white or light, but occasionally darker bands in the paintings. Um, some, in some images, the bar is flooded with a watery element but it continues to read like another plane or a boundary. The more painterly fleshed out embodied section of the painting penetrates the band as an outline, as if the material world could exist in the band only as an X-ray or an intellectual structure, a recognizable form from below, but without substance, sort of a conceptual rather than a material world. So this is, uh, this is Pilar's prediction. Oh, sorry. This is, uh, this is titled The Dream of Icarus. I wanted a form that went rose, both rose and fell. And I was thinking, you know, I was just thinking about that place between the heavens and the earth. And I was trying to put a wing-like shape on this on this column uh, that that rose and fell, and I painted it in, and it was too material, too concrete. I would paint it out. I went back and forth, and when I get uh, in trouble in painting, and there's too much material on the surface of the painting, I often take newspaper and place it carefully on top of the painting, 
and then carefully peel it back to pick up the material, to pick up the paint. And in this uh, painting, another happy accident happened where the wing-like shapes are made by the ink of the newspaper. So they became fragile enough to be able to remain and not weigh the painting down. Uh, this is called Trespass, and I simply wanted that really energetic rope-like shape on the top to slip the beyond the border of the white bar, that watery white bar, and enter into sort of the, the, the netherworld or the, the realms below. So you can see that as it goes through the bar, it almost becomes ghost-like on the other side of the bar. This is the still in the hollow, the same, using the same bar structure. And this is the, the small house of our cautionary being, which is a phrase that I stole from George Steiner's book, uh, Real Presences. And there are you know, a couple of borders here where the, the, the border of the white bar, but then this very sort of rigid architectural black dwelling or house-like structure uh, that also holds this energy in. And this was a painting, I, I, I decided I wanted to paint this painting at night in a nighttime version. So, that was the result. You can see this sort of gate, gate-like form in the background. Okay, this is um, this is the corset uh, section of the paintings. Um, the next group of paintings use a simple form, one that narrows at the midpoint and has visual associations with a corset, a forcing vase, an hourglass, or a torso, specifically a female torso. I use the form to create the central dynamic of the painting, but I want it barely available. Not, I don't want it recognizable as a corset. It was the vehicle for a simple idea, but one that I found rich with possibility and personally resonant. That restriction or limitation is initially rejected, has a valuable shaping function, and depending on the attitude we take to it, can be instructive or defeating. Limitation can and does create energy. The corset form also uh, suggests the vase form, in particular a forcing vase, where the struggle to sprout, to evolve, is visible in a forcing vase, uh, the emerging roots and the stem. Ordinarily, we look at the flower and the, and the leaves, but in a forcing vase, uh, where the seed or the bulb changes into another form, uh, that part is usually hidden from sight and a forcing vase often is reveals that sight. So my years long, really, uh, exploration of this form began when I saw this advertisement in a magazine. I was struck by it not because of any association with feminism or, or any association with sexuality, but because the fabric of the corset uh, was so familiar to me. I had polio when I was three, thankfully not a severe case, but I was confined from my neck to my ankles for a while. Um, and my restraint during that time was the exact color and texture of this particular corset. Uh, this, is a this is also the time that I started to draw because I, I, what could I do? I couldn't do anything, but I did have my arms and I began drawing at that time. I don't really remember having polio, much about polio. I remember exercises, um, but this, somehow this image triggered a memory and the hourglass, the torso, the vase shape really held a lot of energy and interest for a long time. Um, the other repeating form that worked its way into almost all the work, what began as the garden hose, uh, is a compositional, the compositional device I used to break, break up the rec rectangle. 
um, over time, it kind of morphed into uh, vines, corsetize, roots, uh, even a kind of character on its own. It suggested an ability to hold things together, to bind and loosen, to penetrate deep into the earth, and to carry energy. So, oh, and here, uh, I'm just going to show you a couple of, this is the, this is a, Diana Shearer is an artist working in Amsterdam right now. And she, I think these, these photographs, this was a series of photographs called Plants Without Pots. But I loved that she was interested in exposing the same kind of energy that I was interested in. And she is still working uh, very creatively with root systems, uh, her art, artworks, you, well worth looking up. Also, this is, um, this is the American photographer Lee Friedlander. And he did a series uh, when he was confined to bed, people were bringing him vases of flowers. And I love that his focus on, in this whole uh, photo essay was not on the, the tops, the leaves and the flowers, but what you don't usually look at were, were the stems in the vase. Uh, and that was very inspirational to me. Um, so these are just a few of his images. So this is the first corset mm. painting uh, that came out of that after seeing that corset. Uh, this is a small painting uh, as well. And I knew when I did this painting that I wasn't happy with it. Uh, I didn't want to paint corsets. That's not what I was interested in. I wanted to paint a dynamic. So this next painting was much more satisfying. Um, this is called Reply to Saturn. Um, and I really loved that the paint had the kind of energy, explosiveness that I wanted. And also the drawing had the delicacy. So I wanted this kind of strength and delicacy in the same painting where the color or the mass doesn't feel like it has to fit inside the drawing. They, they both have their own sense of autonomy in some way. Uh, this is called the needle's eye. Uh, at the time I was reading about Emily Dickinson and thinking about her amazing poetry in her very severe confinement. Maybe the confinement was necessary for the poetry. The eye of the needle is the restricted space the thread passes through. And all the sewn things in the world result uh, from that ancient technique, from that, if you think about the eye of the needle is a kind of extreme confinement. Um, and I was also thinking about the, the contrary uh, human impulse uh, all, all for, all, I think common to all of us, uh, the impulse both to connect or be known as well as the impulse to conceal and protect. The red X in the upper torso area is like a warning, you know, go no further. And from behind the, the uh, vertical black bar, a rope-like form spirals and reaches toward the viewer. So the point, you know, being to kind of say no and say yes at the same time, which is, I think, something we all know a state that we all know we want to connect and we want to protect ourselves at the same time um, and i think this is a successful use of the of the corset form because it doesn't immediately um doesn't immediately tell say uh anything like that so um okay uh and these are a few more paintings in that this is called Persephone's Return from 2005. Cinch from 2007. This is, this is probably four feet. This is not a, a large painting. Um, and I don't have the, it's an older painting. I don't have the title, but I always love this painting because it made me think for some reason of flamenco. Uh, feels like it's, it's turning. Um, this painting is Breathe, and 
you can see these rib like rib cage like forms on either side. And I wanted the center to just be this kind of emptiness, you know, this breathing place uh, where the bar now is on the top of the painting and is exerting pressure uh, on the rest of the painting. And the skirt area is kind of a counter to the pressure of the bar spreading out. This is called Descending Dress. And this painting is uh, actually in the collection of the Oakland Museum. This is holding together. These next three paintings were paintings that I was doing while I was uh, going through a divorce. So this painting is called Holding Together. Um, this is called Falling Apart. Uh, you can see the corset form. You, can, you can't really see the corset form. It's really almost uh, completely uh, has come apart. And finally, uh, this painting, Parting at Last. It was, I always think of this as my divorce painting, Parting at Last. Um, this image where I was thinking about uh, a seed that cracks, you know, has to, something has to die for something to live. So the seed cracks open and these tendrils or these sprouts that are very vulnerable uh, begin another process. Um, this is binder loosener. Reply to Saturn uh, two. I wanted a watery um, bottom area there. This is called Casa Milagro, a painting I did when I first bought my little house in Sonoma. And you can see inside the red dwelling, just the bare ghostly shape of that corset form with all that growing botanical kind of activity in the center. Uh, this one is border. And these are a couple of the uh, paintings that use the uh, forcing vase uh, form. Uh, forcing the first forcing vase and uh, another like forcing vase two, uh, where the, this is one where the band becomes very dark. Um, this is called Plunge. And in this piece, the corset sort of falls away or that, that torso shape falls away and the pressure, all the activity is held in just with these pink bars on the side. Okay. Um, so, it's, I think it was around the early 2000s. Uh, the simple generic form of a tree became another screen to project the drama of rising and descending and expanding. An image of the unseen inner energy that is carried uh, through to the trunk, uh, to the roots and to the branches. I wanted to show something I could, you know, this is something I feel, uh, but you can't see it. Uh, a tree is limited in, the, in, in, its, in the extreme by its inability to change its location. It reaches up and it reaches down and out. It has this relentless verticality and stability. Uh, for me, trees possess a kind of nobility, maybe something akin to the silence of animals. Uh, many of the uh, following paintings suggest a kind of nature culture connection with the roots visible at the bottom and the treetop forming or containing a Corinthian column. This is another um, self-portrait as a tree where you can see uh, in the top the tree sort of branches uh, contains this sort of cultural um, image and there's the underground stream, this, this just this little sliver of blue 
that happens uh, often. This is upright and rooted. And again, uh, I don't know if you, I don't know why, oh, there we go. Uh, the tree seems to grow into this Corinthian column and down into it, the, the earth. Um, this is dusk and the underground stream. So those are a couple of the tree, uh, tree paintings. So the final form, uh, the, which is the paradise form. Uh, paradise is derived from the Persian word paradeza, which refers to a walled garden. My first introduction to art was also an introduction to the pleasures of a walled garden. As a child, my father was a person, a person who did not finish high school, uh, an uneducated person, but who loved poetry and art, would bring me to the, he brought me to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Um, and you know, as, and as much as I loved the artworks, I also, I think, almost equally loved the quiet and the gardens. Uh, if you've ever been to that to that museum, it's it's really a place to see. Um, the painter Agnes Martin often said that her intention in her work was to turn her back on the world and face eternity. I wouldn't go that far, but it may be possible that there is a relationship between the walls of the garden of paradise, or you could say those things in life that we perceive as limitations and the access to reflection and introspection that those limitations make possible. It makes intuitive sense to me that paradise would have this border or container, a limitation that shapes, protects and focuses. Uh, I also worked on a number of paintings that uh, use a clearing in the natural world, a spot in a garden or a group of trees. And I isolated or surrounded this spot with the suggestion of a window or a door frame, a view uh, to the natural world with only a hint of the constructed world. So uh, let me show you a few of those. And this, this is the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. This is the Alhambra in Spain, uh, a very large walled garden, uh, part of a garden. This is um, the, the garden in the America, at the American Academy in Rome, a fountain at uh, the Alhambra. And also at one point I traveled to Mexico to see the works of the Mexican architect uh, Luis Barragan, and he has many, uh, has done many gardens that are unusual in their lack of uh, sort of, their, their just unusual gardens. But this is his house in Mexico City, and this is uh, a piece he did. I, I didn't actually get to see this piece, but I think this this piece really has so much of what I've been talking about the solidity of that white wall that is a screen for the ephemerality of the shadow of the trees. You know, it's so physical, but it's, it's a receptor for this ephemeral reality. And then this trough, which is ha holding a substance that has no, uh, you know, shape. It's holding the water. Um, so in some ways, it's, a, it's an image of what containment makes possible. In such, it's so beautiful, the, the color and the simplicity of it uh, that, um, anyway, this is uh, the, the first, one of the first of the garden-like paintings. This is Doria Pamphili, a makeshift hut. And I don't know why these are not, not coming up. Uh, okay. Um, so there's this relentless verticality of the trees. This is gifted in November. 
Imagination's Chamber. This is uh, River Road from 2009. And the last two paintings, these are the last two paintings I'll show you are the more sort of things that I've been working on now, uh, the sort of paradise uh, enclosed garden paintings. This is Blue Paradise and this is Blue Repose. So, uh, those are the paint, that is the last of the paintings. And now I'm gonna show you just a very, very short clip of this collaboration uh, that I did with Kurt Rohde and Sue Moon. I'm gonna just run this so you see the context. Uh, I'm not gonna play the sound, but this was the context of the, the piece. Okay, and uh, sorry, I know that's really kind of crazy, but I just wanted you to see uh, how the, the work was projected. And um, this doing this project was full of wonders. Um, it's not something I do ordinarily. I worked with a student assistant who was just brilliant, uh, Benjamin Ashlock. And we made all these experiments. You know, I dropped ink into water. I uh, made watercolor images that were wet and then I would spray them from the top and he would video them. And then we would record them both uh, sort of expanding and then run the video backwards. Um, so here is uh, just a little bit of how Okay, then. And I just want to say at the, the last movement of the piece, uh, I introduced this white band into the, everything. Into the uh, screen and I embedded, uh, we went to a practice session and we did, uh, we took some footage of the performers, the hands of the performers performing. And so I embedded that footage in the white band in black and white um, because the, the title of the, the piece is Artifacts, which is about making. So uh, we just uh, had these hands playing uh, in the white band on the screen. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. If you have any questions, oh. please unmute and Okay. Um. So, Stephen, should I stop sharing? Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe if, if okay. we see your face, then. Okay. There we go. Well, you've you've called this um, wonder and limitation. I, I, I think when I I think I commented when I first saw your paintings, I it, it seems like there was this tension between um, impressionism and 
schematization with um, th that I was kind of taking for like perceptual mode of, of being and, and intellectualization. Um, uh, I mean, sometimes you don't see anything, see something until you actually know what it is and then you can see it. Yes. So, so you have these um, outlines of leaves where underneath there isn't even a smudge of a leaf. And sometimes it's just to clarify a, a, out, a smudge of a leaf. And, and then, of course, trees become Corinthian columns, which is a natural element and a human element. Um, and I just, I really uh, love the, that overlay and how they those two elements dance together. Thank you. Thank you. That's, I like the dance. That's great. <laughs> Carol, uh, you'll need to unmute yourself. There, there I'm unmuted. Yeah. Very good. Um, yeah, um, Francis, I'm so, I actually saw this in person oh. back, back just just days before the lockdown and um you I, I didn't make it to your exhibit i mean to, to the time when you were there with your paintings but um and so i'm so glad because um it is true that this these this representation doesn't doesn't really uh, uh, do justice to the brilliant to the brilliance of the paint and the the texture a lot of the texture you can't appreciate on these um, flat um, images. So um, I, I really appreciate your doing this. Um, I, I, I wish I had heard it when I was looking at them back in, <laughs> back in, two, in earlier this year, but better yeah. late than never. So yeah. thank you so much for doing well, this. Thank you for saying that because it is, you know, I don't want to harp on it, but it is a lot. It's such a loss, you know, to just show these tiny little uh, yes. mm -hmm. images, but um, mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> well, I was lucky enough to get to see the exhibit shortly before we all got shut down and um, up at the Marin Garden and Art Center, I think it is. I think I've got the garden yeah. and the art. And Steve, where you went. And uh, it was it was just a stunning show. It was one, you know, and um, and I it is true that you lose something. But I have to say, I'm almost speechless with seeing all of this. Francis and the everything that you've presented and the connections that you've made and uh, it's just the, really beautiful. So, I guess my question would be, when will you be having your next art exhibit? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? Uh, you know um, I'm I, the one one wonderful thing is that I actually get to walk to my studio. Uh, oh. So I'm we're all so confined, but I yeah. have my studio to go to. Uh, I've been working on some, uh, actually some collages and paintings, which is a hard thing to do in a fairly, you know, I have a mid-sized studio. And once you start working on collages, it's almost like a snowfall, every, there's <laughs> paper everywhere. So um, I, I don't know, um, probably it will be uh, in, at my regular gallery in La Jolla, um, but, I, you know, I will let, I'll certainly let you all know uh, when I have one. I think every time any, any, m many painters, when they have a, a, a show, feel like that it's my last show. I'll never paint again. <laughs> uh, but that, that hasn't proved true, so. Yeah. Francis, I love how your early paintings built into the last two things you showed. And I was wondering if those videos were available. I would really like to see them because that's mm -hmm. that created the most awe in me. That oh, interesting. I was I almost didn't show them. I thought I can't put these on top of the paintings, but um, uh, thank you. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is uh, I live in Sonoma, and when we all have a vaccine, you're welcome to come and visit, and I will show you the whole <laughs> video. <laughs> but um, you know, we we prefer, it has been performed a number of times, but not recently. So I, you know, I have no idea if it will if it will be performed again. 
Well, what about just the video of? The video, yes. Yeah. You know, it's funny you ask that. When I, it, at one time it was shown at the museum in Sonoma with the players and the, you know, it was the whole thing. And it was a great um, performance. And some woman asked me after the performance, I didn't know who she was, but I guess she owns, you know, half of Sonoma. And she said, could I buy the video? And I said, no, you know, it goes with the music. <laughs> um, and then someone said to me, well, you don't, that's not necessarily true. You could, you could say, yes, you could buy the video, but you know, uh, it, you'd have to invite the, I, I don't know, you could put some uh, conditions on it. So I don't know what to say other than um, I'll look into it and maybe I can just send it to you, you know. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, it was so crazy to just scroll through so quickly. And it was such fun to make these simple experiments and have this brilliant young student who, mm. the, between the two of us, we transformed, you know, light on the side of a wall into layering it over other images you know the the technology is amazing uh, i loved how you dropped in the artist hands i mean musicians hands i love that too thank you i really love that yeah and i appreciate mm. your sharing your early story in terms of polio uh -huh. and how we were drawing because that's all you could do in that limited condition yeah. Yeah. and how that was really is the beginning for you yeah and I think because I drew so much my mother always said to me for two reasons she said you should be an artist because I drew and then you know as I got older she said you know you should be an artist because nobody would put up with you you're so difficult <laughs> <laughs> so I I ended up you know as an artist I ended up doing exactly what my mother told me to do <laughs> like many other artists hmm. Francis Francis yes hi I I can't see you but I know who it's um it's Susan Susan, Susan. yes hi Susan I wondered a couple of things. When you did the, uh, what we're talking about, the video, what was that it? loud noise? Can you hear me all right? I can, yes. Okay, I wondered, mm. was it the music that was uh, through you expressed on the canvas or was the music somehow interpreted uh, as forms on the canvas? I wasn't quite sure how that happened. That's a really good question. Um, when I was invited to participate in this uh, collaboration, uh, the text was written by Sue Moon and the music, uh, Kurt Rohde. And that was a question. The first thing I said was, I will not, I, I, I can't do it if I have to illustrate the text. Yes. That's not what I, I, you know, that's not what I do. And so that was not a problem. But we ended up uh, getting together when part of the text was written. I would bring some sketches. Kurt would uh, have some, uh, you know, send some files with music. So it was, it, it developed over time, uh, probably about a year and a half, where we just uh, layered it and in the end, uh, but it was clear that we weren't, I wasn't interpreting the music yeah. or the text and they weren't, you know, we were all sort of simultaneously doing things separately, but talking to each other. And, and expression, listening. expressing, is that right? The idea, you, you had your expression and they had their way of expressing with the instruments, you had the art. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Amazing. You know, it reminds me of how they had a film a way back where people would talk to water bottles. Did you see that? And no. And, and the water would, they had some way of photographing and they'd have different expressions. The, <laughs> the water would, would like you saying that you loved it, for example. So it just reminded me of that. There's something that happens uh, from the music to the canvas. So yeah, yeah. No, that's a good and I will sum up by saying one thing about it because I, I'm like Steve, I couldn't think of any one word on how to summarize, but 
marvelous seems to really capture it. So thank oh, you very much. Uh, Brother, oh, Brother Jim has a question. If you could unmute yourself. I will, I will, I will, sir. Um, I, I really believe that when you get real paintings, which are like what I call these, um, not paintings just of scenery and, you know, people seeing on a beach or things, but real paintings that come from the unconscious, the painter is tapping into the, the collective unconscious and to the collective unconscious of humanity on what's going on in the world. And what I like about those pictures, what I would like to do is sit with them and do active imaginations with them and see what voice will come from those pictures to me and what healing for the world of the mini, which is in a horrendous state, would actually manifest itself. What would those pictures say to me? Healing of the world. Because, because I, be, I believe that, you know, you know, Francis here is a channel for the healing power from the collective unconscious. And I think that's what is so exciting about these pictures. I think they, they can speak to us all about beginning healing to our world. That's why I think they're so amazing. They're such powerful pictures absolutely powerful and mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. well, Jude, thank you so much for saying that because your description of what you would like to do with the paintings is precisely the kind of uh, reception I would like them to get. Wow. Uh, not me telling you this is what it is, but yeah. you <laughs> spending time with them saying what comes up for, for you. Mm -hmm. Because so much of what is in the painting Mm -hmm. has just come up for me. As I said, it's not a conceptual package that I put on top of it. Yeah. It is, you know, it kind of... Oh, my God. ...in the action. Yeah, I think you are a channel of the collective unconscious, a channel of the healing power of the archetype of the self, and that's why they're so powerful. And if we don't do that, we're ignoring something powerful that's giving as a gift to us. I think it really is. Mm. Well, I'll, I'll just so briefly, the, there's one painting in there called Pilar's Prediction. And when I was first living in San Francisco, 1974, 70, 75, uh, it was very hard to pay the rent. And I was working at the uh, airport, uh, taking, uh, I was sitting in a booth taking people's uh, tickets when they parked their car. And I did that for one full year from 10 o'clock at night till six in the morning. And the woman across from, from me came over one day and I was sketching, I was doing a little sketch and she said, she said, that's very good. And I said, oh no, it isn't, it's, it's not, no, it's not good. She said, no, it's very good. Uh, and I said, no, no, it's really not. And then she paused and she got very quiet and she said, you have been given a gift and if you don't value it, you'll answer to God. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. I'll never forget that. Just this, yeah. this little woman who was working in the airport, she had such authority and she said that to me. Hi. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a quick question, uh, Francis, because you're, uh, I was wondering, um, was it through, can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Okay. Uh, was it through schooling, uh, the MFA, that you were able to consistently grab a theme like the bar and the corset and the tree and the paradise topic, uh, or the heading, and you did multiple uh, paintings, um, with different titles, it inspired me so much because it 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 really freed me up uh, in my writing because I have done consistently like one idea of writing a poem about the heart over and over in different. It came out in different ways, and I always thought I'm you just freed me up because of this presentation that that's okay to do that even in writing. You know, and photography is different because you're taking the photo from different angles. But in writing, you know, everything you included in your presentation was so freeing for me. Oh. You know, yeah, it really was remarkable. So I, I didn't know if that came to you from your schooling because of the, the or was it just a life evolution? Like you said, it was the evolution of your paintings that you, you entered one heading of a bar, you know, or the corset and it took off like, 
what five different paintings out of that it's, oh, it's many, like many, many many right that was so remarkable for me because we always think every creation should be so unique and dynamic and this and that you know so we put so much on us like you were saying with the thinking but when it's pouring out creatively sometimes it is you get deeper as you write more on the same topic for me you know i think that that is I think it's so important to trust yourself and that when something is really based in eros, a kind of eros connection that grabs you and there's so much in it. It's like seeing that, just that image of that corset. I mean, at the time that I started using that form, I didn't have a plan. I didn't think, oh, I'll do a lot of paintings about this, but I was ah. so, but the, the eros connection Mm. The depth of what was implied in that form. I'm not like, making out that word. Er, eros? Eros. E-R-O-S. A sort of uh, oh. erotic, in a way, connection. Uh, a very authentic connection um, will bring you a lot of work. If it's not an authentic connection and you're just trying to make products, then it doesn't usually, it's usually a real, uh, doesn't work. Yeah. So when I first started using it, I had no idea it would bring a lot of paintings. I just knew I was really intrigued by it. Mm. Yeah. So mm. I'm glad that you, you know, I'm glad you feel that freedom. Great. <laughs> That's great. Trust yourself, you know, trust yourself. Remarkable. It was really remarkable. I'm very touched, very honored that I got to sit through this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you, Francis. Th well, thank you. <laughs> I can't wait to see all of you at the library again one of these oh, days. Yes. Oh, my goodness.